So good morning, everybody, again. Uh, always when I have to talk in English to a, in a forum like this, I have the, in front of me a dilemma. Or to read a very good English speech, translated already, or to speak in a more fraternal and familiar and a spontaneous way in a no full English. So I chose the second option. I will speak in my English, but in a very familiar way, in a very relaxed way. You will receive a printed copy after that, whenever or whoever who wants a copy, it will be available so, for you. Um, the origin of this uh, talk is, uh, uh, the origin of this talk is in the Council of Provinces in San Felice del Benaco, northern Italy, two years ago. We had a meeting of all the provincials of the order and commissars and so on. And at the very end of this meeting, they asked me, what are the main preoccupations, the main worries, the main concerns of the general council and the prior general? So I had to make a list of preoccupations very quickly, and I shared that list with them, and they said to me, why don't you share those preoccupations in all the provincial chapters so that all the brethren around the world can listen to these topics and can reflect about them? I don't know if the reason for that was that it was a very interesting topic or that they were bored of the spiritual talk every chapter or something. I don't know the real reason, but anyway. So the list of the preoccupations, uh, you have to understand it not in a negative way, not in a pessimist way. I am I'm not a pessimist uh, person. Uh, when I talk about preoccupations or worries, I want to speak about challenges. So I don't, I, I sleep very well thinking into these topics. I lose my, I don't sleep because of the topics, but these are not uh, so <laughs> negative. Yeah? So it's just something to reflect about, it's something to make an exercise of discernment, and I invite you in your provincial assemblies or in your community meetings or in any gathering to make a reflection and a discernment about these topics. And a last consideration before I start the list, some of these topics are very local, some are very universal. Eh? Some of these problems are very local, very concrete in some areas of the world. Nevertheless, I think that it's good to hear this, it's good to share, it's good to listen what, uh, what's happening in the order all around the world. Even though some of these problems uh, does, uh, don't affect this province, for instance, I think it's good to feel family, as Father Jack said, <coughs> to feel that we are an international family and so we share our problems and our preoccupations. And that's why I am sharing with you all the problems, even though some of them uh, don't affect uh, directly your province. So the first one would be formation. In the last uh, 50, 60, 70 years of the history of our order, any official document, any official document says that formation must be the priority in our Carmelite life, in our Carmelite strategies, in our programs, in our plans, and so on. Formation should be the priority. In formation, we are playing our future. We are, I mean, it's so important that formation is the root, is the basement for our future. I have to say that the, that priority, theoretical priority, is not always that in the real life of our provinces. I can understand very well provincials and commissars that they have very urgent needs. I mean, they need a parish priest, or they need a, a principal for the school, or they need any other urgent job in the province. So sometimes formation is not at the first place in our preoccupations, it's not at the first place our, at our priorities, Formation is in the second or the third place in our programs. So that's why I invite you again to take uh, seriously the formation uh, matter. Formation is a very, very important thing for our future. When I talk about formation, I'm not talking just about academical or scholar or intellectual formation. Of course, that's very important also. I talk uh, formation in a holistic way, a spiritual attitude, a way of being in life, a way of listening our world, listening the church, listening the order,
to be open is a spiritual uh, attitude. Eh? So I'm not talking only about titles, uh, about uh, degrees or something like that. that. Of course, that's very important. I'm talking about an attitude of formation. Eh? In that uh, realm of formation, I would like to mention three, just to mention them, three little topics that I think are important to know. One is the renovation of our ratio, as probably you know, we have a very good document, the RATIO is a sort of a program and reflection about formation for our order. So the International Commission of Formation is uh, working on this. They are adding some numbers, Father Queen Connors, which must be in here somewhere, uh, was, in, was in Rome last week uh, working in this. So they are adding some numbers, they are correcting some numbers of our RATIO. I think the ratio, uh, the Carmelite ratio, is a very interesting document and is uh, more valuable than many other things we have in our order. I mean, the ratio is at a very high level, even higher than many other things in our order. So it's a precious, it's a wonderful instrument and tool for formation. It doesn't mean we are going to make a new ratio. I mean, we are not making a new ratio. Ratio constitutions are documents that need a sort of stability. We cannot change them every 10 years, you know. We are just uh, renewing the, the ratio, uh, taking in consideration some problems and some needs and some situations so that the ratio continue being a very good instrument for our Another topic formation. in the realm of uh, formation that we are working in is uh, the joint novitiates all around the world. Uh, the ratio, the documents of the Holy See, uh, the experts on formation speak very often about uh, good novitiates. Good novitiate is the starting point of religious life. Novitiate is a very important period, and so we have to take care of our novitiates. In some provinces, like in the States or the, in Europe or in Australia, it's very difficult to have vocations these days. I will speak about this right now. And so uh, sometimes we have a novitiate with uh, one novice, two novices, one and a half novice. So it is, uh, is the st statistics, you know, according to the statistics. I hope not in real life. And uh, this is not good. This is not a good formation. This is not a good experience. Uh, it's not the ideal experience. So that's why we are working in joint novitiates all around the world. It is working already in America. We have a Spanish-speaking novitiate in Lima, Peru. We have a Portuguese uh, language novitiate in Belo Horizonte, in Brazil, and we have an English-speaking novitiate in Middletown in the States. So it's working already in America. It's more difficult in Europe. Europe is a very complicated uh, continent, as you probably know. We are always dividing countries, uniting countries, separating, and it's a mess. So it's not so easy. Especially in, the, in Northern Europe, there are such a difference between mentalities. I mean, the Dutch mentality, the Polish mentality, the British mentality, so that sometimes it's not easy to make a, to prepare a joint novitiate. But it's almost prepared in Southern Europe, in the Mediterranean Europe. It will be in Salamanca, it will start in 2012, and we hope that it will become the novitiate for all the Southern countries in Europe, and probably, probably also for the whole continent. We are working on, on that. And the last uh, thing I want to mention in this uh, topic, uh, in this field of formation, is about ongoing formation. This is not a problem we have in the order, this is a problem we have in the church. It's a, all the orders are talking about this problem, even diocese and other uh, church structures have the same problem. When I joined in the Carmelites in 1980, Ongoing formation was a sort of boom. I mean, everybody was working in ongoing formation. There were uh, ongoing formation programs in the provinces, ongoing formation programs in the region, ongoing formation uh, programs at an international level in Rome. Now we have very, very little things about the uh, ongoing formation. I think we have lost a bit of uh, interest or preoccupation about formation, and I think this is a lack of our religious life. Again, I'm not, talk I'm not talking about the uh, titles or degrees, or I'm talking about the attitude. I mean, we have to be open to formation because uh, 
uh, we are serving the people of God and we want to do it the best as possible. Information is a very important element for that uh, service and for the quality of our religious life. The second preoccupation will be vocations. This is a dramatic problem in Europe, United States, and Australia. I mean, there is a big, big lack of uh, vocations. I don't want to give you alarmistic numbers and figures, but let us say just two little examples. Spain, traditional Catholic country, four Carmelite provinces, no one novice last year, no one novice this year, probably one novice next year, but it's not sure. So, Italy, traditional Catholic country, no one novice last year, no one novice this year, no one novice next year. They have two, but they are not Italian, they are Romanian. So it's a big problem, and I have not the solution for that problem. And the Pope has not the solution, and the bishops have not the solution. It's a very complex, a very complicated problem. When someone tells me the solution, uh, I, 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 I am afraid, you know, because uh, usually easy solutions for these problems are or, or whether ideological or simplistic or even dangerous solution, diagnosis of the problem. It's a very complex problem, sociological, political, cultural, philosophical, ecclesiological, so it's a very complicated uh, problem. What I want to say is just to send a message of uh, confidence and hope. When I speak to the provinces with vocations, like Indonesia, or India, or the Philippines, or Africa, or some countries in Latin America, I used to say to them to keep on working on vocations, not to relax. Right? So to keep on working in the quality and the quantity of our vocations. This is very important. It's not a question of recruiting. It's not a question of publicity, of propaganda. Sometimes the promotional, the vocational promoters do the, the best for this. You know, they prepare very nice campaigns and DVD and posters and so on. But it's not a question of propaganda. Eh? So we do our best, but uh, we have to be aware that uh, it's a very complex problem and we can only uh, be loud speakers of the call of God. This is a very important task, this is a very important job, and we have to keep on working on that. We have to leave this crisis in a very hopeful uh, way. We have to be believers. We have to be people of hope. Uh, we have not to leave it in a very uh, stressing way. Uh, this is not good. We have to live our life the best as possible. We have to go ahead, we have to be hopeful, and we have to rely on God and to do our best for our vocations. We have to take care with some, let us say, philosophies or ways of thought sometimes we find in our provinces that are a real sort of ars moriendi, a way of dying. You know, some people say, well, we, are, we have no vocations, uh, the world is very bad, the society is very bad, every, everybody is bad, there is nothing to do. So can you imagine some, someone uh, attracted by such a philosophy? Or, uh, it's, uh, it's impossible. I mean, uh, come and die with us. That would be the best. This is not a vocational, the right way of doing things. We have to be enthusiastic, we have to be humble, we have to be optimistic, and we have to live the best as possible our Carmelite life, and that would be the way for vocations. We don't know if, if we have or not, but uh, we have to keep on living our Carmelite life in a healthy, uh, happy, and holy way. And that's the best way of working for Perhaps vocation. God is saying something also in this crisis. I am always very embarrassed to talk about the will of God. Always in my life I was very careful. I, I don't like to talk about what God thinks or what God is asking. I remember when I was studying in the Faculty of Theology, there was a student who is a bishop now, who was very, how could I say, you know, going out and drinking in a good way, I mean, nothing, nothing bad, but very alive, you know. So the spiritual director used to call him and say, look at, God is asking you to change, God is asking you to commit yourself with the church, God is asking you this and that. So once he got angry and he said, please, can you tell God 
uh, everything he thinks about me to tell me directly, because he's always uh, telling you what I have to do. <laughs> it's just a question of good manners. I say to him that it would be much nicer to tell it directly to me, you know. So I am always very afraid to talk about the will of God and what God is saying, what God is saying, uh, who knows what God is saying. But perhaps, perhaps God is saying something in this situation, you know. Perhaps God is asking a more canonical, humble, authentic, uh, religious life. I don't know, but uh, we have to discern and we have to think about it. But I invite you to work for vocations and to leave this situation in this crisis, not in a pessimistic, in a dramatic, in a negative way, but in a very hopeful and uh, lively way. The third preoccupation, very briefly, is the cloister nuns, our sisters. Uh, I have to say, first of all, that cloister nuns are not a problem. When I hear that, I get a little bit uh, angry or, you know, the cloister nuns are not a problem, are a blessing for the order, are a very important part of our family. And they have problems, of course, the very same problems we have about vocations and age and so on, but they are a real blessing and a very important part of our order. Some provinces have some monasteries, some, pro some provinces uh, don't have cloister nuns, but in any case are a very important part of our family. Uh, what I perceive, and this is the preoccupation, this is the concern, is that in some provinces we are not walking with them, we are not accompanying them. It's not a question of take, taking care uh, in an old style. I mean, probably most of them are very mature women, and very independent women, and they don't need a daddy saying to them what they have to do, eh? I hope. Eh? But uh, at the same time, they would like to have more company, more help, more fraternal presence of the Carmelites in our monasteries. Sometimes it's very difficult because of distances and because they have um, their own way of life and we cannot be there all the time talking and wasting time and so on. But sometimes I perceive that the nuns uh, some monasteries, some areas in the world, they are not happy with the presence of our brethren, with the help of our brethren, with the company of our brethren in their lives. So that's why I'm inviting everywhere to help a little bit more our cloister nuns. It could be a contradiction if we are talking about Carmelite family, and this is a very important issue, and at the same time we are not taking care of this part of our Carmelite family. To help them, we have created a fund in Rome, it's the Fondo Promonialibus. It hasn't been so successful as I expected. You know, we wanted to have something like 500,000 euros or something like that. We have only 200 and something thousand euros. But we want to grow this fund for the future in case we have to help uh, all monasteries, all sisters, or monasteries in which there are a lot of vocations and they need money for formation and so on. So if any one of you feels so generous to help this uh, Fondo Promonialibus, you will be very welcome. I can tell you also that in some parts of the world, the cloister nuns are very alive, they have a lot of vocations, imagine Dominican Republic, the Philippines is incredible, they have nine monasteries and they keep on uh, growing, Father John Mali helps them very much, and I'm very thankful for that, John. So it's a blessing for the order, and I think it's worthy to think about it. The fourth preoccupation, this is more administrative or at the level of, gov of government people, the lack of is Carmelites, the lack of brethren, for the international organisms of the order. I think the next general council will have a big problem with this. What I want to say is, every year is more difficult to find people mm, able to develop an international job. Uh, we have to be conscious, we have to be aware that we are an international order, an international family, and it is very additional uh, organisms in Rome. I mean, the Institutum Carmelitanum now is almost a virtual institute because uh, we have very few people in Rome working for the institute. We have created a task force uh, to uh, work hard for the future of the Institutum Carmelitanum, that is a glorious institute in our history. 
But we find problems also to get people for the Curia, to get people for the jobs in Rome, uh, for other international commissions, and so on. I say that in this province, and I say that very openly, because this, is, this has been always a very generous province, with prior generals and general counselors, and presidents of the Institute, Father Pat uh, McMahon was the president in the last sexenium. Many of you are in the international commissions, so I feel very thankful to the PCM province for your help and for your service to the order. But sometimes in other provinces we, we find a lot of problems to get people for these international jobs. So that's why I am underlying this uh, concern all around the world. The fifth preoccupation is a wonderful one, it's a very nice one. It's uh, the topic of missions. As you probably know, the last uh, General Council did a very, very good job in this field, did an enormous job in this uh, field. We have now Carmelites in Cameroon, Mozambique, Kenya, Burkina Faso, Vietnam, Trinidad, East Timor, and some other countries in which we never ever thought to be. We have an established presence, we have vocations, and the order is growing very much in all these countries. Some provinces have been very, very generous economically, financially, at the level of personnel with these new missions. And we are very happy for this. And these missions are working well. There are some problems, of course, and so on. But uh, the order has grown quite a lot in the last 10, 15 years. And this is a very good news. But at the same time, the problem we have now is that uh, we have to, let us say, consolidate many of these missions. The problem is that they are working well. So they have vocations, they have novices, they have the habitude, the custom to eat two or three times every day, and they need books, and they need uh, to study, and they need a computer, and they need a house, and we have to build a new house for novices, and many other things. So the concern, the preoccupation is this, that we have to establish, we have to consolidate all those missions. And that's why we are making an appeal all over the world uh, for help with all these missions around the world. It doesn't mean that we are going to do only this. We are going only to consolidate the missions we have already. We want to grow. We want to be in new countries. In this sexenium, we have opened already two new missions. One is in Tanz Tanzania, the Napolitan Commissariate of La Bruna uh, opened uh, the mission in Tanzania, in Africa. And the other one is Papua New Guinea, a mission of the Filipino Commissariat in a very poor area. So we, are, we keep growing, and we want to grow, we want to dream in new missions. Ivory Coast is a possibility, Cuba is a possibility, the Carmelite sisters there are always asking for the Carmelites to go there. They say Cuba has an enormous future for the church, people are hungry of God in Cuba, and perhaps it could be a mission in the future, I don't know. I used to say, and this is a very, this is a little bit, uh, do you say in English pedantic or pedant or <laughs> pedantic idea, but uh, you know, just to justify my presence here, I have to say something <laughs> intellectual. Some of you will, will be thinking now, uh, to say that, we need to bring a fellow from Rome to say these concerns, so I have to say something more impressive, you know? <laughs> so I used to say that uh, we mix the Trajan and Adrian policy. Trajan and Adrian were two Roman emperors. Trajan used to say the Imperium has to grow continuously. If we stop, we die. So we have to keep on growing, always. That's why Trajan was a very military, and very proactive uh, in, in conquering new countries and so on. After Trajan, Adrian followed the contrary policy. He said, no, this is very dangerous, to, very dangerous to grow and to grow and to grow. We have to establish the limits. We have to consolidate the border. We have to Romanize these people before we go further. So in my opinion, what we are trying to do is a mix policy between Trajan and Adrian. We have to consolidate, we have to establish our missions and our foundations, but, but at the same time we, have to, we want to keep on growing in new countries, in new continents, in new areas of the world. The sixth preoccupation is a little bit uh, deeper, 
And I just want to mention it, and probably you will have uh, other places and other occasions to talk about it. It's a problem of identity as Carmelites. In some provinces, especially in Europe, I don't know here, but in Europe, in some provinces, it's very strong. There is a debate between the youngest generation and the oldest generation of the province. The oldest generation, people between 60 and 80, they are very uh, sensitive regarding pastoral, to live in the midst of the people, inculturation, and so on. So they lived the Vatican, Second Vatican Council, they lived the post-Vatican period, so usually are very pastoral people, uh, concerned in pastoral jobs and parishes and schools and so on. The new generation say that uh, they find in the order a lack of identity, a lack of uh, our charism, our identity. We have become uh, diocesan priests, they used to say. Uh, many times they say, well, to be a diocesan priest, I don't, not, I don't need to be a Carmelite. I can be in a parish, living by myself, and so on. So we should underline the community life, the prayerful life, and all those things that uh, are so important in the Carmelite charism. So there is a big debate between these two groups. The old people or the uh, mature people say, well, what are we going to do? We are going to be watching television all the time and praying and uh, uh, playing cards in the recreation room. We have to work for the church and for evangelization. And the church is appealing. The church is calling us to help in the new evangelization and so on. Are we going to live in a uh, comfortable life in our rooms doing nothing? So the young people say, no, no, it's not that. It's that we have to underline and to reinforce our prayer life and our community life, our Catholic elements, and so on. I am a man of reconciliation, and I can promise to you that these four years I have to make a big exercise of reconciliation with many uh, debates and tensions and so on. And I used to say that uh, both are right. Both are right. I used to say to the young generation, look, at, it's truth that we are not diocesan priests, and that would be a mistake. But we are not either, we are not monks, we are friars. And to live in the midst of the people is a very important element of our charism, of our charism almost from the beginning. So we have a responsibility in this field, a pastoral responsibility. So we have to live our community life, our prayer life, and so on. But at the same time, we have a pastoral responsibility that we, have not, we cannot miss. And I said to the former generation that uh, it's very good to work for the people, it's very good to work in parishes or in the schools or in any other apostolate, but if we forget our elements, our life, that becomes, that starts to be dangerous. So we have to combine both elements, and this is very important. We have not to be rigid. Mendicant wisdom is the contrary, absolutely the contrary of rigidism. We, so our, has, our houses are very flexible. If you are living in a parish, it's normal and it's good and it's healthy that you cannot pray like if you were in a novitiate house. I mean, that, this is wisdom, this is flexibility, and this is typical Carmelite eh? and typical mendicant. But this debate is very interesting because uh, it remembers that we have a strange identity as Carmelites. We have not a concrete job. Sometimes young people ask, what is our job? <laughs> Schools, hospitals, teaching, parishes? No, we have Carmelites working in all those fields, uh, even bishops or many, many different jobs and works and pastoral tasks in our Carmelite life. So we have to be flexible, we have to be wise, but we cannot forget our Carmelite identity uh, wherever we are working. So we have to keep our elements, our identity, our charism. So I say to the young people, listen to the former generation because they are saying something important and I say to the former generation listen to the young people because probably they are saying also something important. We have to listen to each other, we have to discern, to make an exercise of discernment all together and I think this can be a very positive and a very fruitful debate for our order and for our... And the very last concern is a personal maniatic idea. 
uh, among many other handicaps that a prior general has, uh, even at the psychological level, one of the handicaps is uh, maniatic ideas. I suppose everybody has uh, maniatic ideas. And one of my maniatic ideas is uh, self-esteem as Carmelites. We have to work very much in our self-esteem. This is a psychological term, as you know, uh, and it is very important for a healthy life uh, at the level of individuals, at the level of communities, at the level of provinces, and at the level of the order. We have to work on our self-esteem for two reasons. The first one is because there are many, many elements, many, many persons, many, many jobs, many missions all around the world about which we can feel very proud of our Carmelite identity. If I have grown in something in these four years, that is self-esteem. I have known so many brothers, so many sisters, so many lay Carmelites working around the world in a heroic way, in a wonderful way, in a generous way, and I feel very much prouder of my Carmelite identity now than four years ago. We have many elements to feel proud of our Carmelite family. This is a matter of fact. It's true that there are problems, and quite a lot. There are lacks, and there are weaknesses, and quite a lot of all that. But we have many things to be proud about our Carmelite family. So this is a matter of fact uh, to, work, to grow in our self-esteem. Sometimes I, I get a little bit angry when someone says, well, I cannot wait anything new from this province or from this order. Uh, we cannot wait anything new, you know. So a part of the arrogance of this uh, expression is not truth. It's not truth. And this is the second reason of our self-esteem, a theological reason. If we are believers, if we are Christians, and I suppose most of you are believers, uh, we believe John 1.14, Hologos Sarx Egeneto, Verbum caro factum est, uh, the uh, word of God became flesh. Right? We believe that, and we proclaim that, and we preach that. But we have to believe in concrete life. What is hologos, the word of God, the, pro the plan of God, the history of salvation, the will of God, all that. But what is flesh? What is sarx in Greek? Sarx means history, life. Uh, real life, and I say that that's truth, but not with capital letters, with the small letters. Huh? So the word of God made history, contradiction, life, concrete brethren, the people around me, the structures around me, the history around me. Is the only way, is the only place in which I can find the word and the will of God in the people around me. There is a nice poem of a Portuguese poet, Fernando Pessoa, that seems a play of words, but it is not. The poem says like this, the Tagus, Tagus is the river, it's, a, it's an Spanish river to tell you the truth, but it, it finishes in Portugal, so they always say it's a Portuguese river, but the, the, big part, the, the biggest part of it is in Spain. Anyway, the Tagus, is more beautiful than the river that runs through my village. So the Tagus in Lisbon, if you have been in Lisbon, it's a wonderful river, big, enormous, majestic. Eh? The Tagus is very, is very much, uh, is more beautiful than the river of my village. But the Tagus is not more beautiful than the river of my village, because the Tagus is not the river of my village. So it's more wonderful, but it's not more wonderful because it's not mine. So when I hear someone saying the Jesuits have done this and that, the Claritians have wonderful schools, the Salesians have done missions, and I say it's true. I know that the Tagus is more beautiful than the river of my village. I know that. I'm not stupid. I'm not so stupid. But they are not more beautiful because they are not mine. These are the river of my village. These are my people. This is my family. This is my province. This is my community. This is the brethren. These are the brethren God gave me 
to find him and to find his will. And this is the river of my village. And no other river around the world can be more beautiful and more wonderful than my brethren and my sisters. And this is a very important thing. And it's not a pious consideration. It's not only a pious consideration. It's something very deep theologically. Eh? Verbum caro factum es, the word of God became flesh. Tertullian, the famous theologian, said, um, ergo, therefore, caro cardo salutis, flesh is the way to salvation. If verbum caro factum es, if the word of God became flesh, flesh is the way of salvation. I can only find salvation in flesh, that is, in my brethren, in my community, in my history, in my contradictions, in my weaknesses, and all that that surrounds my life. This is the big and the deep theological reason why we have to work a little bit more in self-esteem, because my brothers are something very important. Sometimes we think they cannot surprise us. That's a very atheistic expression. When I hear somebody saying, Oh, this province cannot surprise me anymore. You know, there is nothing new to discover in this province. Uh, we are not able to do this, we are not able to do that, we are a mess, and so on. I said, oh, you are very atheistic. Huh? No, no, I am a believer. No, you are not a believer. If you are a believer, you believe that any brother, even the most simple, even the most stupid, even the most boring, are a way, are a place in which God is showing his grace. And if God is a God of surprises, my brethren are brethren of surprises. If we are believers, if we are not, that's a bigger problem. So that's why I invite you to enjoy your brethren. A former general, prior general said to me when I was elected, I was asking for counsels and, and so on, advices, and he said to me, enjoy the brethren, that is the only counsel, enjoy the brethren. I can tell you that in the last four years, I have enjoyed quite a lot my brethren, I feel very proud of them, and I am sure that we can uh, still work for the people of God, for the church, and for humanity. Our Lady of Mount Carmel, that is our Lady, our mother and sister, will help us in the event. Thank you. a little detail. With these words, we declare officially open the provincial of the PCM province, the provincial chapter. Thank you. Now, those of you who know me know that I am not the brightest bulb in the pack, okay? <laughs> Good thing I know this is right.